Bueno, buenas tardes a todos. Y hoy tenemos el honor y el placer de tener al doctor Volker Diel eh, con nosotros. Eh, el doctor Diel es eh, director emérito de Medicina Interna en la Universidad de Colonia en Alemania. Es eh, presidente y fundador del Grupo Alemán de Estudio de Linfomas de Hodgkin durante 30 años, eh, del que actualmente es presidente honorario. Fue un pionero en eh, lo que es el tratamiento de Hodgkin y asimismo eh, es director y fundador del Centro Nacional del Cáncer de Heidelberg y fundó en la ciudad de Colonia, en Alemania, el Centro de Oncología Integrativa Haus Lebenswert, eh, que es una casa dentro del campus de la universidad, eh, y esta casa la construyó con el objetivo de mejorar la calidad de vida de los pacientes afectados por el cáncer a través de la integración de las diferentes terapias complementarias con los cuidados convencionales. Es, es un placer tenerlo eh, hoy con nosotros, espero que disfruten de su charla y aprovechemos para también hacerle preguntas para intercambiar eh, experiencias y poder aprender de una persona tan sabia como el doctor Diel. Doctor Diel, it's a pleasure and an honor. Thank you for being with us. I am a medical oncologist and I'm a molecular biologist and I'm a medical doctor. I have treated many thousand patients with cancer and I found out after 20 years in the business that it is very important not only to treat the body but take care of the soul and do something for the patient's interior. And when we had about 15,000 patients in our computer of Hodgkin patients, young patients, the median age was 32 years, then I noticed that young patients after eight, 10 years in complete remission have great problems. They have fatigue, they have infertility, they have problems with their heart, problems with their ego, problems with their body and mind. So I thought we have to do something. And I always dreamt of a little house on the campus of this terrible university clinic with 18 stories where people could sit on a sofa, put their feet up, listen to Mozart music and have a coffee machine and let the mandibula hang down so to rest. And one day, a leukemia patient helped me to collect in three months two million Deutsche Mark, and then we built the house Lebensfeld. And I'm talking a little bit about this. And I'm going back to the uh, European medicine. And I want to tell you, I'm very strongly for integrative medicine, integrative oncology but I'm not for alternative medicine when it is not curative. And we should not tell our patients, take some alternative medicine and leave chemo or radiotherapy. This is dangerous and I fight that. So I say, well, we need curative therapy, but on the same side, we need something else that helps the patient to become competent to become a doctor in the patient himself. When I talk about um, this, I thank my friends, Gerd Nagel, Thomas Effert, and Harold Mattes. Uh, he's a natural past to help me to produce these slides. And uh, in many discussions, we have gone through all that. And I hope I can convince you that we need medical oncology, molecular medicine, but on the same side, maybe with the same balance, need integrative medicine, integrative oncology. And we should not fight against each other. We should combine and use complementary power to look in the same direction, shoulder on shoulder and not opposite each other. So the topic of my talk is the roots of modern medicine and come, this means complementary and alternative medicine, turning to integrative medicine and the patient's competence and survivorship. And this is very important in Hodgkin patients because we can cure 90% of our young patients. 
over 90 percent. When I started in 1978 with the Hodgkin study group, we had 40 percent cure. Today we have 90 percent. But this is not through alter alternative medicine or complementary medicine. It is through our chem uh, chemical and radiotherapy. And today, now, with our antibodies and molecules that we can offer our patients. It started with Asclepius, this old Greek doctor, the father of the European physicians, and his philosophy was healthy lifestyle and a healthy, happy mind. This is very important. That is what the Chinese tell us every day. And his medicine was plants and natural products. And this is a young Greek man in the scripture of the ninth century, uh, and he disperses plants for medicinal products. In the Middle Ages in Europe, and you see here some very terrible instruments that they used not only to draw out the teeth, but also to heal wounds in the wars that were going on in Europe at this time. And it said, the medicus curat natura sanat, the doctor um, cures, but finally the nature is healing and gives the final salvation. And medicine was with plants, herbs, water, soil, and other natural ingredients that you are talking about here in this conference. And the doctors were considered as healers, but likewise as priests. There was a spiritual dimension in the profession of the doctors. But the church was almighty and nothing happened without her blessings. And here you see the nun has cured the patient and celebrates her victory. And the poor doctor has failed and is helpless and goes away and is very sad. This was the church was a mighty um, healer and nothing happened without the almighty church. At this time, there was a natural religious concept. Causation was, uh, and it is written in the Bible in the Old Testament, if you have sinned, you will be punished and therefore you get sick. And you can only become healthy again if you pray and uh, do good things. And uh, this is what we heard in the Old Testament. So there was a man in Switzerland, Paracelsus. He had the name Theophrastus Bombastus Paracelsus in 1400. And he was a great nat naturopath and he claimed that there is an external doctor, this is the medicus, the doctor, and there's an internal doctor, this is the doctor in the patient. And both are responsible for the healing process, that means the salutogenesis. And this dogma of um, Paracelsus is a big discussion now in Germany when we talk about patient's competence, that means Doctor finds the doctor in the patient, and then they talk to each other on eye height. Not hear the doctor, hear the poor patient in the bed, and you talk over the patient. See that you are always in high sight, and try to keep the computer out of the vision between the doctor and the patient, because then there is an interruption of the eyesight. So, in the other influence in Europe, an uh, alternative or complementary medicine was the traditional Chinese medicine. And here, as you all have heard here on this talk, uh, in, on this conference, health is a balance between yin and yang and the five elements, an equilibrium of body, mind and soul. And disease is a disharmony of yin and yang and it is terms of the flow of life, energy, the chi, whatever the chi is, I don't know, and no Chinese could it really explain. We discussed it with Laura, possibly it's our soul, our spirit, our internal power of life. If this is gone, we are dead. So whatever chi is, let's take us at our internal life and our power to live. And so what these uh, people do and preach in the uh, uh, um, traditional Chinese medicine is acupuncture, massage, breathing, exercises, 
and the movement that tied Qi and Qigong. And this is the most important thing for young patients when they have fatigue. And they sleep and they get up and cannot work. The best is active mobilization, what the, uh, the Chinese tell the Qing and Chang, and the, we call it shadow boxing. And psychology, pharmacology doesn't help. The only thing is the active movement of the patient himself. What uh, the influence of traditional medicine is health, is the balance of the individual with the social, natural uh, uh, and the equilibrium of body, mind, and soul. And disease is a disturbance of the genetic and somatic hemostasis, the balance in itself, the perturbance of body, mind, and soul. And what is that? Uh, the causation is bad lifestyle, is disharmony with nature and with the surrounding, with the clan, with the family. It's very important in Africa and in China. And the symptoms are disease, and what you could do is natural drugs, restitution of mind, soul, homeostasis, and this is coming in harmony with yourself, get the flow of your energies. So what happened is European medical medicine and traditional Eastern medicine is now producing modern science and technology-driven medicine. But here is the computer, here is the laboratory, is pharmacology, is molecular biology, and modern science-driven medicine is characterized by evidence-based, disease-oriented pathogenesis. We want to know whether the virus, the bacterium, causes the disease. The outcome is very important, that people live and are healthy again. Primary endpoint is kill the last tumor cell and psychosomatic and social aspects are secondary or tertiary, and most of the doctors in molecular medicine do not take very much care of that. And this is a problem. When I understood that, I said, well, we have to do something. So uh, what happens is that we understand today that our tumor is DNA, uh, a misinformation uh, in the DNA, gene mutations, viruses, chemicals, ionization, and the disease is an organ cancer. And then we use chemo, radiotherapy, or molecular genetic targets. We use antibodies or molecules, and then the tumor has gone. But what happens with the soul of this patient? What happens with the patient? Uh, modern science has created the molecular medicine, and we are very proud of that. We have cure in uh, about 90% of our patients. But the patient, he wants something else. He wants to be caressed, he wants to be put in a pallium, a mantle around him, or that people take care of him and touch him and touch his soul. The patient wants solace and for his soul and mind, and he wants somebody to put his hand on his wounds and be with him when he is sad and wounded. So uh, CALM today what has become a mixture of unproven alternative methods and useful supportive measures used by many doctors to strengthen and reconstitute the self-healing capacity of cancer patients who are weakened by chemo radiotherapy. Complementary and alternate medicine are very, very prone in America. And you see that about 33.9 billion out of the pocket are spent every year for calm products, non-vitamins, non-minerals, practitioner costs, yoga, and whatever. So this is an enormous market now in the United States and also in Europe. The most commonly used calm therapies in Europe are psycho-oncology, homeopathy, anthroposophic medicine from Steiner, and the Chinese methods, including acupuncture, phytotherapy, naturopathy, osteopathy, and chiropractic. Why do patients use that? And I am sure that about 80% of my patients getting chemo radiotherapy used under the table something alternative. So I always said, please 
take it up on the table and let's discuss it. Let's know what you do. Because if you take something that is not helping you, but harming you, and interacting with the chemotherapy is dangerous. So please ask your patients, what do you take that I do not know? And please let's talk about it. So why do patients do that? They expect higher cure. They want to help to control the symptoms. They want something for their soul. And they want to reduce side effects of cancer treatment, but it's sometimes very hard. And they have a better control over their lives and take an active role in their salutogenesis. And they're wanting to get better, feel better, and live better. Sometimes they are believers. I think, I think it's the acupuncture is working, and the other says, well, please, I had enough. Give me some aspirin. So uh, there is a little bit shift between 50% of our patients. So in Germany, mistletoe, and in Switzerland, and in Austria, it is very pronounced. It is very difficult. There's an enormous popularity among patients, but there is a strict refusal by many doctors. But it is that we do not know too much and we do not talk to each other. The naturopath and the medical oncologist don't want to talk to each other. But there is definitely an effect of this mistletoe. And I take this as an example of things that are taken beside our chemoradiotherapy. So there is tumor inhibition, there's immune modulation, it is a cytokine, and there's immune protection and sometimes there is improvement of quality of life. There is a big review about the um, power of uh, the complementary cancer therapies and especially of mistletoe. And this group in Germany, Kienle and Kiene, and, and, and it's a couple, uh, they say the best evidence for efficacy of mistletoe therapy exists for the improvement of quality of life and reduction of side effects of cytotoxic therapy. But there is no proof yet for a survival benefit shown beyond the critique. And therefore, in the Cochrane review, it is said you have to do well-controlled randomized uh, prospective studies, and you have to have independent evaluation of the results in the uh, positive breast cancer studies, and then repeat uh, in different settings and don't take um, the controls away. You have always to have a control, otherwise you never can prove it. I know that the doctors say, well, how can I prove a uh, very difficult um, uh, psychological or subjective effect? It, I know it is a very big problem. It is much more difficult than uh, testing chemotherapy versus radiotherapy. But we have to think about how we can prove that, otherwise the market will always be an alternative market and doesn't come in uh, the, the gripe line of the uh, normal uh, oncology uh, scenario. So what we have in nature uh, reviews is anecdotes and what is missing are large randomized clinical trials. And this is just what we need. We need large clinical trials and get away from just the um, subjective emotional uh, anecdotes. So today, the fundamentals of modern oncology is a shift from calm to integrative medicine. We have the conventional cancer therapy that we all uh, think is very important. Chemoradiotherapy, targeted therapy with new molecules, antibodies, and gene therapy. But at the same time, we have to integrate the complementary cancer therapy. That means partnering the patient and building a coalition between doctor, patient, and survivors. So being able to know what causes the cancer, but also being able what helps the patient to get healthy and living in harmonize in himself. So, uh, there are complementary, uh, complementarities between pathogenesis and salutogenesis. Mainstream medicine uh, asks for the pathogenesis. Why do people get ill? What are the risk factors? Welfare, healthcare, we can help this patient with our chemotherapy, with our randomized studies. So, what is the mission? 
save the drowning man. And integrative medicine has salutogenesis as the main target. Why do people stay healthy? What are the protective factors and the resources of the patient? What is the empowerment and the self-help? And the question is, learn to swim. This is very important. Uh, Aaron Antonovsky, who uh, created the expression salutogenesis, he said, not the circumstances itself define the luck of man, but the ability to cope with these circumstances. That means if you are sick, you have to face this is a reality and I have now a new lifestyle. I have to get rid of this disease, but I have to fight it and I have to do my own uh, possibility to, to, uh, to fight against it. This is very important, the rule for the patient difficult times. Never give up, don't stop to fight. This is extremely important for our cancer patients. So, integrative medicine sees the patient as partner, as subject, and not as object. Not as object of the doctor's powers, skills, and expertise, and integrative medicine helps him to become a competent partner of the doctor. What is patient's competence? The, defini the definition of patient's competence is the ability to integrate cancer, the handicap or trauma, into an individual strategy of the patient himself to self-defense policy in an attempt to overcome the hardship and try to live a normal life. This is very hard. The patient subjectively wants to understand his or her illness and seeks ways of self-healing power. That means salutogenesis. The doctor is interested in the pathogenesis of the disease. He objectifies the disease and he says, well, did we have a complete remission? Is there a progression? What is the tumor-related symptoms? And um, he does not meet the psychological and spiritual demands of the patient, at least not very often. I come back to my friend Paracelsus, Bombastus uh, uh, Theophrastus. Uh, he visualized a better understanding between the patient and the doctor, who both recognize a complementary reality and experience the disease. When the treating doctor speaks to the doctor in the patient on the same eye height, and this is extremely important, if you understand the doctor in the patient, what he knows about the disease, what is his power, his empowerment, his strengths, his fear, then you understand the patient much, much better. So medicine, the external doctor, this are we, we operate, we radiate, we chemotherapy, target therapy, but this is the doctor in the patient. And he has a metabolism problem, nutrition problem, fitness problem, power problem, psychology, and he's sometimes weak, and he doesn't believe anymore in God. So this is the internal doctor, and he has to fight all that. And we are just objectively giving radiotherapy, chemotherapy. It's much easier for the doctor. But here is the big problem in our patients. So the uh, three columns of patient's competence is comprehensibility, meaningfulness, and manageability. That means the patient wants information. He asks, what happened to me? Why me? And he looks for motivation. What can I do? Why? And he asks, what, what is it? How can I train myself? How can I speak to myself? Where are the powers that help me to get out of this whole of fate. So integrative medicine does not only ask, is the patient alive, but he asks, is the patient in life? And this is extremely important. That means how he feels, acts, and loves. So integrative medicine is mainly survivorship. Every patient diagnosed with cancer is a survivor. And in Germany, we have maybe 2,000 new Hodgkin patients, but we have at least 30, 40,000 Hodgkin patients, they are survivors. So this is our problem, not the, only the ones that are diagnosed tomorrow with cancer in, in Buenos Aires or in Argentina. It is the millions of patients that are li alive. When we cure more patients, we have more survivors. And what should be done? Survivors of cancer 
need a thoughtful and comprehensive follow-up and, if necessary, complementary interventions and preventions through integrated medicine. This is the reason you are sitting here. Our clinical trials, and we are very proud, we put from 40 to 90 percent. But what we did, this is an amalgam. It is a combination of all these phases. The computer can do that. So integrative medicine is, in my opinion, gives back the individual phase of the single patient. From this study, from 20,000 patients in the computer, it's a mixture. But then give it back. What did we do in our German study? We, after 20 years, and I cultured the first Hodgkin cells, 1978, and I found the CD30 antigen on my tumor cells, and now we have an antibody 30 years later with a little bomb, and it cures a lot of patients. This was enormously important. But after 20 years, I noticed we do something wrong, and we don't take care of our souls of our patients. So this was, here's my tumor cell, here's the single Hodgkin cell, and we look for relapse, we look for progression, salvage, secondary tumors, and these are the curves. And when I found out that every little tick, 20,000 ticks on this curve, is a fate of one patient. This is the late second sequences, vital organ, secondary neoplasias, endocrine dysfunction, gonadal dysfunction, and quality of life, and fatigue. And this is what we do now in our Hodgkin studies. And when the patients started to draw these pictures in our house Lebenswert, and this is like monks cry, you know, help me, please, do something for my burning soul. We asked for cognitive function, emotional function, social function, fertility, libido, fathering, mothering. And then <clears throat> we started that. And you see here, this is a normal emotional function scale of the German population. We are a little bit sad. Maybe uh, in Argentina you are up here. But our Hodgkin patients don't get up to that anymore. If you look physical functioning, here you see our group that is doing Nordic walking. Every morning they go for Nordic walking against fatigue. So they never get up to the normal value. A lot of my young patients are marathon runners, but they never could do it after chemo radiotherapy. So we have to do something for them. Then there is fatigue, and this is the normal tiredness of German people, maybe you're down here, you're less tired because you have better weather and you have better meat and wine. So um, this is our group of patients that never come back to their normal fatigue status or cognitive function. Think of a teacher, a nurse, a doctor, uh, a professor. He never has his cognitive function again. And this is something very, very difficult, what we have to face. So we had a house of dying. This is our hospice. My mother died there with a cancer of the colon, and we have 40, we have seven children, we have all children. We have 40 people, we sang every day, it was great. We had choral, it was a celebration. So we did that. But so, then I s said, well, we have so many young people that are alive. They will live 40 years. We have to do something for them. And then we built this house Lebenswert, the house for the living people, the renaissance of these people. That means we realized the dual reality of the cancer patient. This young breast cancer girl painted that. She dreamt of her hair, but she was still there. And the other patient, this beautiful lady, had her hair always in front of her. And she said, well, there is a dichotomy between the patient's phenotype and she asked me, who cares for my soul? And this was a cry when we started this house Lebenswert. Unfortunately, now this doesn't get out. So uh, actually, here's a text that is overwritten by this house Lebenswert. It's not a very nice house. It's very nice. It was two million uh, Deutsche Mark. Today, it would be maybe two, two million euros. But at least we have a room where the patients can meet. They have conferences, they have psychological treatment, they have uh, physical treatment, they have Tai Chi, Qigong, Aroma th Therapy, they have acupuncture, and this is all third money. We have to s collect 500,000, we beg for 500,000 euros every year 
to pay for this house. We don't get money from the government, we don't get money from the uh, health care or insurance, so everything is packed, please help us. And the patients do that, they're very happy. Lebenswert has become a model of integrative medicine in Germany now. So we do psycho-oncology, we have five psychologists, art, painting, sculpture, gymnastics, music therapy, Feldenkrais training, Nordic walking, dance group, acupuncture, we have a theater group and we have a choir. And this choir is really good. So if the patient starts and paints a picture, it's dark, it's black when he is depressed. And then when yellow and green and blue colors come up, I know the leukocytes go up, the thrombocytes go up, and the soul is lifting up to heaven now again. And this is very important. So we have a choir. It was terrible when they sang the first time I play the violin, so I can, uh, I can tell you. But now this choir, every Tuesday, with this opera singer, they are meeting, and this is an excellent choir. They give concerts now in Cologne, you know. It's unbelievable. And this means integrative medicine could be the balance between cure and complemented by care and ambition of our molecular biologists, medicine, people like me, mitigated by empathy, and this is important. So uh, I want to conclude, we as doctors should be the modern Janus figures. This means Janus had two faces. One, looking at the evidence-based medicine and kill the last tumor cell. But the other one, look at the suffering face of a human being demanding the most empathy we as doctors can offer in our life. And I want to conclude with this, my friend Antoine Saint-Exupéry, and the little prince went back to meet the fox. And now here is my secret, a very simple secret. It is only with a heart that one can see rightly. What is essential is invisible to the eye. It is t the time you have wasted for your rose that makes your rose so important. Men have forgotten this truth, said the fox, but you must not forget it. You become responsible forever for what you have taken care of. You are responsible for your rose. And I think our rose is our patient. And I think integrative medicine is now coming and meets academic medicine. And you see, we are not far, too far. We are sailing off and we have to give the best proof what we do, but we should not get in fight with modern medicine. Thank God that we have these molecules, that we have the antibodies, but we have to add something integrative, complementary. I thank you very much. This is my group in Cologne that helped me, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Volker. That was outstanding. I, I hope this was as inspiring as uh, I, I heard you uh, for the first time two years ago at the Society of Integrative Oncology, and your talk was so inspiring for me. And I hope and I'm sure that it will be inspiring for the people that uh, have listened to your talk for all of us today. So thank you very much. Let me start by asking, uh, how is your view on how you how you face medicine and integrating uh, uh, all these complementary therapies with your patients? How is it for your other colleagues, for the oncologists and for the people in academic institutions? And I know this is a tricky question, but I'm happy if you can give us some light on this. It is very difficult. Uh, when I started, to speak about integrative medicine and building a house for our patients for Lebenswert, then um, I was about 63, 64, and I had already gray hair. So my my hundred young doctors uh, that really loved me and we are like a family. They said now our chief gets a little bit senile. <laughs> he thinks <laughs> of death and dying, and so uh, they. It is very difficult if you take in the university a young doctor who wants to become a professor, he wants to become famous, he wants to write a paper in the New England Journal, and then tell him, please come and speak with the patients. 
and take 30, 40 minutes to just face a patient and talk about his life and his problems. It's very hard. And I tell you frankly, Laura, that I have big problems to get my young molecular biologists and medicine doctors that are very nice persons. We can play soccer or play tennis together and we can drink a beer, but it is very hard to bring them in the house Lebensfeld and give a lecture for patients. So it needs that we start with the students already. The students are very open, but when you once are in the red race of the university or a big hospital and the administrator tells you how much time you should take for your patient, you have no time anymore for integrative medicine. They say this is soft skill and we cannot measure it by computer. So everything what is measurable by computer or by my molecular biology, that is what counts. And therefore it is very difficult, I tell you. Therefore start with the nurses and the young students. Get them a vision and a mission in their heart that they have to take care of the soul of the patients. Later, it's too late. How, how do you get uh, your patients to believe in integrative medicine? You cannot, you cannot prove love to your wife or to your husband. You only uh, by wording. You can only do it by hugging him or bringing every Saturday a rose to your house, uh, to your wife and say, well, I love you. And by doing things, not by just talking. So uh, patients now talk to other patients and are giving testimony how much it helped that they have now psychological help in uh, House Lebenswert. That means we have conferences with the patients. We will have a next uh, year uh, the ninth international conference on, uh, on Hodgkin's uh, lymphoma. And we have 500 patients that come and we have a patient day, and they talk about integrated medicine. And these patients give testimony. There's a question about if there's any specific treatment for children in your institution. Yeah, this is a great problem. There are two problems. One is if children get cancer, then you need a certain a pediatric psychologist that helps uh, these patients. We don't have children in our house Lebenswert, but we have created in the pediatric department a psychology group that works together with us in the gynecology, in the urology. Children, when they are uh, cancer patients themselves, need special psychological help. Something else, the second problem is if children of a cancer patient, of mother or father, experience the disease of their uh, parents, and this is very difficult. The eight-year-old girl says when the mother loses hair, e, you are dirty, I don't want to kiss you anymore. And this is a great thing. Therefore, we have a help group for children of cancer patients and understand their psychological problems and help them to get around with their uh, problems with the uh, deceased cancer parents. If there's any experience uh, that you know of a compared uh, trial between patients, uh, Hodgkin patients that have been treated with chemotherapy and radiation versus chemotherapy, radiation, and integrative medicine approach? We have not yet a prospective study because this is very difficult. We just are in the process of realizing that these patients need help. And like you in Argentina, we don't have money for um, uh, integrative medicine. So we have to go now to the foundations, to the German Cancer Aid that has about 120 million euros per year from private money and go there and ask them to help us to do a, a study. One group that gets help for fatigue, the other group, you just talk with them and tell them the story. So this is a very difficult problem. We haven't yet started that to compare in a prospective study, but we are in the process of doing that. We only can say if a young Hodgkin patient gets to Haus Lebenswert and works on the fatigue, 
that they have an extreme improve in getting them better with their fatigue. That means going to this uh, shadow boxing every morning or do um, Nordic walking or any physical help. You, know. uh, you have talked about salutogenesis. So, uh, and also about looking at the eyes of the patient is so important. Why do we call them patients? That means it has a, a meaning of something passive, patients and passive. Uh, and this implies giving a lot of power to the doctor. Why don't we call them something else? Uh, give me an example. How should we call them? <laughs> um, you know, uh, what we tend, uh, in the, at least in the medical oncology and in the uh, research, we call them partners. But um, many patients wouldn't like to be called partners. They sometimes think they are partners by coming with an internet and big papers from, um, from Sloan Kettering, from MD Anderson, from the lymphoma. If you want to go on the internet, look on the lymphoma.de Deutschland, then you see what we do with our website for lymphoma patients. And you can go in the internet, look how lebenswert.de, then you can see what we do with lebenswert. Unfortunately, so far it's only in, Eng in German, so not in English. So um, I think, I would think that pa a patient doesn't come from, that the patient is patient. It comes from um, suffering. Latin is patienti, is, is suffer. That means that the one that has an uh, existential diagnosis of cancer is somebody who suffers, who is taken out of his way of living, and suddenly his life changes. It is an existential truth that there is a change in my life. So the patient doesn't want at this moment to be partner. He wants somebody who is taking care of his sorrow and understands and can listen to him. So I think we should think about uh, something else. The worst would be if we uh, tell him he's a customer. Say, that now we have patients that pay for it, so they are customers. And they come like you take your car in the garage and say, well, I pay for it, I want it fixed. And they say, well, I have uh, some problem with my heart, with my kidney, so please, here is 1,000 euros, fix it. This doesn't work. Patients are not customers. Patients are partners on a suffering um, uh, dimension of life, and we have to realize that. But to stand over them and talk over there, whatever we say is ex existential for the patient. The scientific truth is not important. It doesn't exist for the patient. If you say somebody, you have Hodgkin or breast cancer, this is an existential truth and will change the life of this patient. This life will never be the same as before. We have to realize that. And if we realize that, then we talk in a different way with our patients. I'm a survivor of breast cancer, and I had chemotherapy and radiation 21 years ago. And at that time, I was in the United States having these treatments. And I, I read some books of Bernie Siegel, which were very helpful at the time. Uh, Love, Medicine and Miracles, Peace, Love and Healing. And he used to say that it was important for the patient to take control of his illness. What do you think about that? Yeah, this is what I said with the competent patient. That means try to find out the doctor in the patient. And this means salutogenesis. Uh, give the patient um, um, an handle to own empowerment, to self-help. And you have to find out, is this a very uh, scary patient? Is he a very brave patient? And then deal with that. And try to find the way that you partner him in developing a new feeling getting over this trauma, getting over this hardness, and then find 
a new way of living with the cancer as you possibly have done. And therefore, I think this is an ex exactly the right thing to, to do and to, uh, to describe. You know. And then there's a question about um, how to get economic funds to do research and whether we should go this way to try to move research in, in order to make advanced integrative medicine. Yeah, before we do uh, research, we have to get the fundamentals of medical, uh, uh, of integrative medicine in our hospitals, in our society. Research always starts when you have a question that is over, um, just the question, how can we cure a patient? Before I did research in Hodgkin's, I had to ask, how can I cure this young man or girl uh, with a tumor and the bee symptoms, the um, uh, night sweat and the fever and the weight loss? Then, when we had A and B therapy, then we asked, can we be a little less toxic? Can we go from 4 ABVD to 2 ABVD? Can we go from 40 gray to 20 gray? That means when we have the right answer for integrative medicine, and you have a house Lebenswert in Argentina, here in Buenos Aires, then you can ask, okay, now we have the money, we have the people, we have five psychologists and uh, 10 different people, voluntary, that work with us. Now let's ask, is it really helpful to do massage or to uh, acupuncture or whatever? But first of all, we have to get the basis for our integrated medicine and develop and handle uh, to help the people in their psychological problems. In what measure is this medicine integrative in Germany is covered by the insurance medical sociales? So the question is whether this integrative medicine in Germany is covered by the social security or by the medical insurances or... Yeah, uh, this is a very important question. Um, when I um, was a director of a huge clinic with about 100 doctors, I went to the in, um, uh, insurance companies, and we have 260 health insurance companies in Germany. So I went to the richest one and said, well, can you help me and get me a psychologist for my cancer patients? They said, no, oh, this is too expensive. Why don't you take one of your doctors and put a psychologist on this position? So uh, we have no, yet, not yet, we don't have openings for integrative medicine, but we are in the process. And the insurance companies understand that the health of the uh, survivors, cancer survivors, is much better when they get integrative medicine, psychological help, and uh, the help that I talked about. So there is a process of now understanding that not only medicine is curing cancer patients, but also integrative medicine is very important. So we are just in the process of getting some money for this work in House Lebenswert. Maybe in two years we get two psychologists, one doctor and one musician that helps us from the HMO or the insurance companies. Not yet today. And I have one more question, if you could comment on whether you think that this integrative medicine approach is better to do it in an individual basis or it's better to do in groups, like group, uh, like you call, uh, talked about your prostate group or the support groups? Uh, it depends. There are people that need single help face to face mm -hmm. and they are so shy. They don't want, definitely men, don't want to talk about their problems. They say, well, we are the strong, they are crazy. They say, we are not the strong, you are the strong uh, um, um, gender. They don't want to talk. They don't want to confess that they are weak, that they have a problem. We don't like to talk about our problems. Maybe to our wife, but even then we have problems. Uh, therefore, there are people that need single face-to-face -face help. And other people will benefit if they find out I am not alone with my faith. There are two others. They have 
a stage 2B Hodgkin. It is, was very strange. I had a beautiful young girl, and she got Hodgkin. And she was, um, she, she was the first time she was sick. She wanted to go to Canada with her boyfriend, and suddenly she had a bit lymph node, had to take me out, and got radiotherapy. And she was taken out of her life. So she went in the internet. She was very good with the internet. And she had a Steve in Seattle went on and he said, yes, I had Hodgkin 2B. But please, I cannot talk to you now because I'm going skiing on the 4,000 meter mountain. Can you call me tonight? And she said, well, there's a 2B patient 10 years ago. He is going to ski, so I will be here. So it is important to have the community of faith uh, in a self-help group. And others, they say, no, I never get in a self-help group because I have trouble myself. So there is a psychologist or a person that talks to this single person. Mm -hmm. So you have to decide, and the patient has to decide. Okay? I think it was a, this was a great talk, and I'm happy that we had a good opportunity to ask some good questions as well. And we thank you again for your presence here and for bringing some light to, to our community. Thank you.